So it's time to start with the keynotes uh, in the conference. This year we wish to focus on disseminating and reflecting on projects with a strong social element with the potential to transform individuals, communities, and society as a whole. We believe that this, that this new family of documentaries have a lot to say regarding social change and activism in our time, and that's why we want to provide an outlet for them to be seen and generate debate at Interdocs Barcelona. So let's start with keep an eye on to some thought-provoking IDOCs this year, focused on social and activism issues. And now I welcome on stage Judith Aston. She is co-founder and co-director of IDOCs, Judith has interest in using interactive documentary to facilitate intercultural dialogue. She started her career by working on pioneer, pioneering projects with Apple Computing, the BBC, and Virgin Publishing, completed her PhD on interactive documentary in 2003, and co-initiated the first IDOC Symposium in 2011. Uh, she is an associate lecturer at the University of the West of England and is actively developing IDOCs related projects through her affiliation with the University Digital Culture Research Center. It's a pleasure to have Judith with us and a round of applause for Judith and welcome to Indetox Barcelona. Thank you, and thank you Arno and bon dia a todos. <laughs> I used to live in Barcelona for one year uh, about 15 years ago so I'm very pleased to be back today. So this morning I'm going to talk about interactive documentary and live performance and I, what I mean by that is I want to um, I want you to think about how live performance might inform the way we make, do, present and interact with interactive documentaries not just as a live performance with people standing up, people playing music, people doing things, but also taking performative elements and putting them inside web docs. So hopefully this will be of interest to any of you making or thinking about making or working in transmedia, so anything to do with interactive documentary. So about me. Arno's already introduced me. So this is our IDOCS website. We've had um, three symposia. Our next one will be in March 2016 in Bristol. So we hope to see some of you there. We're just starting to curate that now. Um, but we also hold IDOCS Presents events. So we have speakers coming whenever they're in Europe, come and talk for us in Bristol. We're co-editing a book on interactive documentary and we have already co-edited a, um, a special journal of documentary studies on interactive documentary. And I'm co-director with Mandy Rose and Sandra Gaudenzi, who some of you may know. So that's our... Um, at iDocs, that's our Twitter, and iDocs.org is the website. And that, that's a, one of the conversations that we convened in 2014. So that's, that's me and my work with iDocs, the organization. And then I also am a maker, and I have a background in anthropology. And what first drew me to interactive documentary I worked with the BBC, they had an interactive television unit way back in the late 80s, early 1990s, and we were working on um, video disc projects, the big silver <coughs> disc, and then on CD-ROMs, and finally on the internet. And I've been working with um, an anthropologist from Oxford, Wendy James, um, on and off for the last 10 years, and she's worked in the Sudan over 40 years, and she, right from the beginning in the 1960s, she took a cine recorder and reel-to-reel -reel audio, and she's continued to document the stories and the journeys of the same group of people over 40 years. So that's an amazing story. But what I've been interested in doing with her archive is curating multiple points of view, so that's three video clips of the same, the people that she knows so well, 
talking about displacement and about being refugees, but from three very different perspectives. So by juxtaposing and creating a database narrative of the material, you can then narrate different stories and have different people narrating their stories through the materials. So that's me as a maker. It's about multiple points of view that interests me. And so that's the anthropology. And then I also work uh, as an anthropologist very interdisciplinary. So I've been working on live performances with musicians, um, actors, and uh, what well, I come out of the filmmaking side of things. I'm a moving image specialist. So this was a performance we did in Bristol um, called The Russian Winter, which layers a Russian novel, The Master Margarita, onto Bristol, onto contemporary Bristol. And we have the devil uh, coming to Bristol to cause havoc amongst the um, complacent and the disillusioned. And you see again the triptych, the three screen idea has come through in my live performance work. And this was another one I, project I did last summer. It was a, a prom in Bristol. So there's a string quartet playing and we use live projections of them playing. And then we had other cameras for other angles. And there's four, two over there and then two. So one behind each musician. And we use live VJing to layer close-ups over the mid shots to uh, give a, a closer um, look at the musicians for people who weren't in the front row. So I've just started thinking about how to bring live performance and interactive documentary together. So in terms of definitions, first of all interactive documentary, for us it's fluid, it's porous, it's a very open, open-ended form and we believe the best way to predict the future is to invent it, which was Alan Kay, um, a quote that Alan Kay, a big computer interface pioneer made. So we have a very open-ended, inclusive idea of what's interactive documentary. Anything that has a computer that invites an audience to interact in some way or other. So it's a web doc, an installation, a mobile experience, uh, a live performance. It can be lots of different things. And that's my um, website, 21st Century Filmmaking, Moving Image, Coming Into These New Ways of Working. And I'm, I, there's a video on there called My Take on Interactive Documentary, if you want to know more, that I made for Sage Publishers, for the Sage Knowledge Collection. So that's Interactive Documentary. Live performance, again, um, there's the traditional idea of a theatre, that's a cinema. I put no one in it and no one on the stage because it has, the stage has a lot of potential for an audience to sit and watch, an audience to be on the stage, for there to be a dynamic between the, what's happening on stage and what's happening in the audience. So live performance can be lots of different things in that setting, but it can also be... Um, in a different setting, it can be out in the world, so it can be people making proclamations. This is Bill Drummond, who I draw a lot of inspiration from. He um, was in, in a band called the KLF, and he set up a project called The 17, and he says, he talks about the iPod and about music, and he says that he, when he first found the iPod, he was very excited by it, but now he's very bored by it and that he, he thinks we need to go back to liveness and live experience rather than just loads of screens and loads of bits of fragments of information everywhere. So his thing, the 17, is, is a live performative uh, music experience with a choir, and the choir perform to themselves and uh, it's not recorded. So he has a very purist idea of live performance, but what I draw from it is the idea of a sense of time, place, and occasion, and how we can take those three things, time, place, occasion, and bring them into our thinking about interactive documentary. And here's another performative context. This is Blast Theory, uh, a UK group of artists, and they have people 
recording. So she's recording her stories, her feelings as she's navigating through a city and it's being streamed onto the web for an audience and there's other people recording and then they'll go and look at the different experiences later. So that to me is also performative. So if we look at bring that into documentary, we've got Man with a Movie Camera, uh, the idea of life made unaware, uh, using the camera, he was very anti-drama, uh, he saw drama as being the opiate of the masses, so for him it was about capturing fragments of reality, putting them together in new and interesting ways, so he's a huge inspiration for interactive documentary. And interestingly, in 2012, Sight and Sound had a survey of documentary, and Man with a Movie Camera was voted the best ever um, documentary, which is very interesting, because as a, as a film made in 1922, it's a huge inspiration for our non-linear, interactive way of thinking about things, and it's really popular with everybody now. This is Ricky Leacock, he talks about sense of time, place and occasion, using interactive, do uh, using documentary to really create a sense of place, a sense of being there as being what he really wanted to do. That's him with the Flaherty um, filming in 1948. And then Jean Rouche, um, he, his very reflexive style of filmmaking. This is my anthropologist, Wendy. Um, she is being very reflexive here. So she's working, these people she's known for years, they're listening to an audio tape of them talking in the 1960s. So they're, they're, she set that up very reflexively and they're very spontaneously responding to those memories. And she's both in the moment, very happy to be there, but also thinking as a researcher quite reflectively. So it's an, another form of um, documentary. But I think that's quite a performative act is the point I'm making. Okay, and then we have 24 Hour Jerusalem, a massive um, transmedia project that was filmed over 24 hours in Jerusalem, capturing a sense of the unfolding moment and mediating it uh, through the web. And Nick Broomfield at Sheffield said, documentary is the medium that captures the adrenaline of the spontaneous moment as it unfolds in reality. I think interactive documentary uh, had a lot of potential for that. So different ways into performance. We can think of it as pre-recorded presentation. So I've got a couple of clips to show you of performance, a performative element embedded in a web documentary, not in an actual live performance. This first one is a journal of insomnia by the Canadian Film Board and it was produced with the Canadian Film Board but with um, the directors were graphic designers from an agency um, in Canada and I, I know them and they insisted that if it's about insomnia they wanted people to experience it only at night. So I can only show you a clip, because if you want to experience the website, you have to sign up, and then they will call you, and they'll say, right, you have two hours in the middle of the night, or sometime overnight, to experience this. So I'm going to show you the video clip that documents it.
Okay, so what, what they did was they invited the public through the, inter through the web to tell them stories about insomnia. So they've curated all those stories and then they've taken four major stories and created an interactive experience where you're invited into the houses of four different people through that face uh, in the middle of the night and you're phoned up, you're woken up in the night, you know, you give your phone number, they phone you and then you're allowed in for only two hours. And because it has a sense of time, place and occasion, people find themselves spending longer on the web doc than they might otherwise. So that's a, that's a tip, you know, one way to draw people in is to have this performative element that happens in this case works very well for the subject matter as well. Okay. Um, another example, this is blast theory in England again. I can't see hands, so I, I don't know how many of you might have already experienced Karen App, but she's a life coach. This is a recent Tribeca funded project and uh, it's designed for mobile phone and you download it on the App Store and then um, she makes appointments with you and she asks you questions. I'll show you the video clip in a minute. But it's very performative because if you don't, she'll say, right, we'll have our next meeting tomorrow at 10 o'clock in the morning. And if you don't then at 10 o'clock go to the meeting, she'll keep texting you through the day saying, where are you? You know, why didn't you turn up today? You know, I still need to talk to you. So it, again, it happens over nine days in a very performative way. So it's just another way to draw in an audience. But let's meet Karen. Hi, good morning, hello. My name is Karen Elliott and I'm launching today a new life coaching service. I've got a brand new method which I can show you. I've set up a tiny demo so when I press here, a sample statement comes up. Then you make your selection, and that's one of the personality profiling scales which is unique to my approach. So. So whichever kind of life stage you're at, I hope you consider my services. To find me, search for Karen is my life coach in your app store. That okay, so um, as you go through answering the questions, the idea is that she gathers that data about you and then they've got lots of different clips and depending on the way you've answered the questions, you get clips that, so she responds to the way you answer the questions. So it's like a performance between, it's like a conversation between you and her. Um, so it's just another way, again, of bringing an audience in. And again, it's appropriate to the kind of idea of a life coach and the subject matter. So that's another example. Um, this one is Jonathan Harris's work. I haven't got the... Um, this one, there, is, there isn't a video clip that illustrates this for you. You have to sign up for this. And it's called I Love Your Work. And it's about uh, women in New York who make um, lesbian porn. And you have to, in order to access this, you have to sign up. You pay, and this is an example of using a performative way to actually create a business model for access into an interactive documentary. You pay $10 there's only a certain number of um, viewings every day. Um, I think it's 10. And then you, you pay $10 and then you're given 24 hour access into this story. Um, and again, because you only have 24 hours and because you've paid $10, you find yourself spending a lot longer inside this program than you might if it was just sitting on the web. So again, it's using that idea of time, place, and occasion. It makes the experience more of an occasion so that you actually potentially engage with it more. So it's another top tip for, for thinking about how to draw an audience in to this work. So that's performance in performative events embedded within 
web docs. Then you've got performance as live present presentation. So you've got Casper Sonnen in, um, at IDFE, IDFA Doc Lab, who every year he will have live performance of interactive documentary. So he had The Seven Deadly Sins performed as a live experience uh, in November 2014. He had This Is Bear 17, I don't know how many of you know that project from a couple of years ago, about um, grizzly bears and their relationship with humans in the National Park in Canada. And that, that's Jeremy Mendes performing it live. So it's a computer program. He's operating the computer program while he's got a live you know, performance of music to accompany it. Um, and this is Brache, who I'm sure uh, many of you have come across from UPN, uh, who does a lot of really innovative, interactive work. And he, whenever he presents his work, it's always a performance. So he's been performing Alma, A Tale of Violence, which is a web doc. But when, when he performs it, you get another, another layer. And then this is the kind of out there guy of documentary, Adam Curtis, who's a British um, filmmaker and journalist. But he, he makes... Um, political statements about the world and he, he creates these huge documentaries for television. Um, his most recent one is for the web only, Bitter Lake. It's a commentary on the global politics of the day. But he did a live performance called Adam Curtis versus Massive Attack, which is a Bristol band that I've been working with people who you know work very closely with them. And uh, he did this at Manchester International Festival, and he had 11 screens, and he just had this onslaught of, of visuals, and then he had live performance from Massive Attack playing behind the screens and responding to it. And then Adam Curtis you know, narrates his own documentaries. So I'll just show you a bit. It, it was a huge audio-visual onslaught. <laughs> It's quite, for, for um, Catalan speakers, that's, it's quite hard to understand him, and it's probably very hard to translate. So I thought I would just, what he does is, is he creates an argument, and then he narrates it over his films, and he has said that actually for him the best way to perform his, his ideas is through live music and live events, creating an immersive experience for the audience. And he talks a lot about Putin, about the media, about journalism, about the um, stories that we are sold through, and Florian will talk about this this afternoon, through linear storytelling. And he's, he's trying to create non-linear arguments. So he's connecting this event over here with this event over here, and he's creating these kind of non-linear, multiple point of views arguments to actually create quite a strong discourse or set of arguments. So watch out for massive ta uh, for Ma Adam Curtis because I'm sure he'll be doing more of these live events. Okay. Okay. So then, performance where the audience get to participate is is the next idea. Uh, Korsakoff, there's Florian speaking this afternoon. He set up um, some software for non-linear storytelling, um, and this is one of his talks, Linearity is Overrated. I'll leave that to him. Um, but this is an example of him doing one of his Korsakoffs as a live show. So you have the Korsakoff, the interactive programme, 
But then he had two experts um, putting across different points of view, and then he would moderate that, and then the audience would get to choose, on the basis of the arguments and the discussions, which, which of the ideas they wanted to go with in order to progress the narrative in the uh, interactive film. So that, that's an example of a live, interactive, participatory performance. Um, here's another example, Choose Your Own Documentary. This was touring um, a year or so ago. It's a British film by Nathan Penlington and Friends. He bought one of those Choose Your Own Adventure, a book, where you say, you know, do you want to do this or do you want to do that? If you do this, go to page two. If you do that, go to page five. So you get different routes through a story. And he bought, he bought a whole selection of these as a child, and inside one of them was a diary with somebody's name in it. And he took it upon himself to trace the person who wrote the diary to see if he wanted his book back. Um, and it became this whole interactive documentary about looking for the guy who'd written this diary. And again, he does it with an audience where he, he's actually live as the narrator. Adam Curtis narrates inside his films Nathan Pennington is a performer, a spoken word performer. So you get a combination of, of a narrator, the film, and then the audience, you know, choosing what to do. And again, the majority uh, opinion progresses the narrative in that direction. Okay. This project recently, this is from Bristol, where, where I'm from. Um, this recently won the Tribeca Storyscapes. So that was very exciting in New York. This is an experiential documentary. So again, I'm showing you stuff that we might not think of as being pure interactive documentary, but there's ideas we can take from this. And as I say, interactive documentary, I'm trying to keep it as open as possible so that we can take ideas from different places. And this is um, an experiential journey where you are blindfolded and shoeless and one by one, you're taken into an installation and you follow a rope and you hear stories of people who have suffered loss and through that loss, their lives have been transformed. So that's somebody, that's one of the pictures of somebody talking about it. There's not much documentation of this because they don't want to spoil the actual experience, but I can show you their video trailer. This is a labyrinth. For now, all you need to do is follow the road. When you're blind, there's no sun except its warmth. There's no blue skies, no clouds. There are no walls. There, is no, there are no limits to your world. You are a body standing on something in space. Can you feel the hairs on your cheeks? Are they wide awake? So the idea there, that's the picture, they're trying to paint pictures in your mind. So it's all audio and blindfolded. And um, towards the end, you actually, you enter a space and you have to kind of move in that space and surrender yourself to the experience in, in order to leave it. So it, it, it's a very, um, people have said about it, you know, that it blew them away, that, it, that it's a very, very powerful experiential documentary. So it's a different way of thinking about audience participation and interactivity. Uh, and then this is another way. This is again a, a Bristol-based Duncan Speakman has set up something called um, Subtle Mobs, which is the opposite of Flash Mobs. It's where it's about celebrating the present, about home, belonging and loss, this particular piece, as if it were the last time, you 
put on headphones and it's MP3, so it's audio again. And it's a performance because everybody meets at a certain place and then Duncan will conduct everyone and say, right, have you got your headphones on? Have you downloaded the app? Right, when I say now, press play. So we go now, everybody presses play at the same time. And then it, it, it instructs you to walk around the city and to um, listen to the stories. And sometimes it will tell you to do things. And everybody has, you know, diff slightly different, there's different stories that different people are experiencing. And it brings people together. It asks you to pick somebody near to you and dance with them. It asks you to stop and feel the wall, to touch the ground, to look up, feel the wind in your face. And, and so it's a very um, experiential thing again. And he's performed that all over the world. And again, people say, you know, it blew them away. It, it's a very different type of interactive uh, documentary performance between people. Uh, another one produced in uh, Wales where you had to get a train from Bristol to Newport, which is just across the border into Wales. And um, it was funded by the space in, in um, Birmingham that have a lot of lottery money to fund interactive work. And you had a num each night you had a number of participants who signed up to play and were told to go to the train station, meet the border guard, get their papers, and then get on the train and go to Wales. Beforehand, they were sent a load of information. The idea is that they are citizens in the near future trying to leave England because everything's gone horribly wrong in England and they all want to go and live in the independent Republic of Wales, but you have to get past the border police. In order to do that, you have to learn a lot of information about yourself and about Wales and about the new situation. So you get on the train, um, you, are, you have a, a camera on you, and that, that, then there's a whole load of players online that are watching you via the web cameras, and then they decide one person is a terrorist, and the online audience decides collectively who they think that person is, and then when the people get to the border, they say to the border police, they send a live message saying, I'd watch out for that person or that person, or we're a bit suspicious of them, and then you get interrogated, and then the, the documentary bit is, at the end of it, you get bundled off in a van. Either you've been arrested or you've been let in. But you get taken off in a van to a safe house where you meet actual, you know, real refugees, asylum seekers, people who are trying to get into, into England. And they tell you their stories and you share a meal with them. So it's a mixture of fact and fiction. It's a mixture of live on-the-street performance and performance online and it's the National Theatre Wales that are very interesting because they don't have a building so all their theatre is out in the streets so it's, it's a new type of performative theatre that's out in, in the world so that's the border guards um, that you meet when you get there so performance as live creation um, this is where the audience are actually creating the documentary material as they go along this is Rider Spoke, another blast theory project, where um, people cycle around the city and they get given um, a GPS locator, they get given a screen and they get instructions and you're instructed to cycle to a place that's special to you and then it'll locate where you are. Then you leave a story and then that story is then uploaded and shared with other players and then has been made into an archive as a story of, of different people's stories around a city. But while you're cycling, you can choose, you can say, I want to go and make another story, or I want to go to a location where there are stories that I can hear. So on the fly, in the world, you are creating bits of documentary and listening to other people's bits of documentary. So that's kind of like a living, evolving, participatory documentary. Uh, this is a project that I've been involved with. Um, it's a film, and we've come up with a new term. It's on my website called Wraparound Filmmaking. And this is, you know, the interactive documentaries here, but then there's all these other things happening with transmedia storytelling that we need to, you know, we need to be aware of because the boundaries between them shouldn't be um, rigid. You know, there should be 
flow of ideas across these different ways of working. So I had a future documentary grant to work with Jeannie Finley, who this film um, premiered at Tribeca um, in April. It's premiering in the UK at Sheffield. It's about um, when Elvis died, Sun Records found somebody who sounded like Elvis, said, if you wear a mask, we'll make you really famous because the people still want Elvis in their hearts and minds, so you can perform as Elvis with a mask. And um, it's all about the compromises he made to, um, in order to be rich and famous. And our wraparound, this is our React sandbox, is called I Am Orion, and we want the audience in the performances, in, in the screens of the film, there, there is a live performance of um, an Orion, an, an Elvis impersonator singing Orion songs with a mask, um, there's a memory box online that people can submit their memories. Fans can submit their memories from America when he was performing uh, back in the day. And then we have a, um, you can have, make an online mask, you can make a tribute, so you can do, um, sing a song yourself, upload it to the gallery. But we also want people to make their own masks. And this is an Orion fan at the premiere in Nashville because he was from the Deep South. And this is somebody who knew Orion, who's got a very personal connection with him, um, and her family have. So she came with this amazing, elaborate mask. And, and so it's a live, performative thing, where the idea is if you wear a mask, if you think about what wearing a mask means, how you perform differently with a mask on, it helps you to empathise with the core theme of the documentary. So that's performative wraparound elements. Then we've got Everyday Rebellion, which are two Irish brothers that um, have been touring their film and their interactive um, documentary. They've got a web hub, and it's about everyday resistance. And they have on their website uh, 21 tips for uh, everyday resistance uh, and how you, know, how you can fight oppression and dif different ways you can do that. And they, ha they have um, several interviews with activists, so I'm moving into the activist idea now. And this is the Yes Men. And they, they have interesting ideas about performance. So I'll just play you there. So these guys have been doing, not in interactive, they've been doing activist performative acts for years, but now their work has been incorporated into interactive documentary. Welcome to Everyday Rebellion. My name is Mike Bonanno. I'm from the Yes Men. that I've got for other activists who are working on a low budget is to think about hiring unwilling actors who might be very good at their jobs, like the police. For example, we got hundreds of police to participate in one of our pieces of street theater simply by an Occupy Wall Street announcing that there was going to be a violent, arrestable action. And because of that, we announced it very loud so the police could hear, and then they followed us with hundreds of them which meant that we had conscripted a huge group of uniformed officers to participate in our theater, <laughs> which of course wasn't fun. It was funny. So if you're doing an action in public, realize that you probably want the police to be there. It's not something you don't want to not embrace their presence, because they, they act very predictably. You know, in most circumstances, what they're going to do. Even if it's violent, you know that they may do it in a controlled and predictable way, and it can become part of your theater. And every piece of theater needs a protagonist and an antagonist. And you're not going to look like the good guy unless the police are there confronting you. You can turn it into... Okay, so, you know, these guys are really experienced in this stuff, so we can learn a lot from, from them about activism, calls for action in our, in, in our social interactive documentaries. Um, another project which uh, we're very lucky to have Ram here today to talk about Priya um, Shakti, Shia Prakti. Oh, God, you're too, I've got it wrong. Uh, but anyway, it, this is about um, rape and violence against women in India. 
and one of the calls to action that they're doing is painting murals all over India, in Indian, in, um, Indian cities mostly, but also in the villages. So you'll have people painting a mural, uh, and then people start to watch and say, well, what, what's this about? And then they, these are augmented reality murals. So then if you have, in, in the cities now, you know, a lot of people have got iPads, so you can use your iPad and a thing called Blipper to create um, augmented experiences to get the story um, that this, these murals are depicting. And Ram will tell you all about it, so I don't want to steal his thunder. But here's an example of, you know, this is children kind of buying into the story, fight violence on the streets in India. So that, that's a direct form of activism. Uh, another interesting project, 24-hour Jerusalem, where they had the market. Um, basically, they used vines. It was, a it was Arte in France did a 24-hour broadcast from Jerusalem with lots of journalists, lots of people filming, but they asked the public to make short six-second vines, and they've got this huge website of documenting 24 hours in Jerusalem involving people. And obviously, you know, activism, internet, Facebook, Twitter, and the Egyptian revolution. And then just to finish, you know, how... So that's live performance happening on the fly, but then how do you curate that for reflection for people who weren't there in that sense of time, place and occasion? How do you recreate that, keep that special sense of the moment, but curate it for other people? Um, Rider Spoke, they've done a piece called Riders Have Spoken. It's not online yet, um, it's been exhibited, but where you've got the city and you've got where the stories are, you can navigate the website and you can click and hear a database of different stories. Everyday Rebellion have it on their website. Um, a lot of curation of people, you know, inviting people to send in their non-violent material, plus their tips with people who are past experts at um, activism and using the media for activism. And then this, for me, going back to my multiple points of view, this, to me, is a, was a very important project. It was a good few years ago. Again, it was Arte and Upian in France about life in Israel and life in Palestine. And this is the first time I saw an interactive documentary that was really a manifestation of my thinking about cross-cultural communication. But they did it over 40 days, uh, one, two clips a day on French and German television, one short clip from Israel, one from Palestine, curated into a 40-day timeline. But as that, and that's about everyday life, but towards the end of filming, actually events happened in Palestine, you know, that there was more violence broke out. And so they tried to bring the context of the news at the time, the sense of time, place and occasion for putting these clips up, filming one day, editing really quickly, putting them out on national television. There was a real sense of time, place and occasion that's lost now when you go and look at this. So what they did was they created a blog with news from Gaza to kind of tell the rolling story. So they, after the 40 days, they tried to keep in touch with people. But when you look at it as curated content, you need the context somehow embedded in the stories because otherwise you lose that sense of time, place and occasion. So um, just to finish, what I'm trying to do with, with Wendy, with, with the Sudan material, is I'm trying to look at past and present. So this is the 60s. That's a book that Wendy wrote about her work, and those are the photographs in there of that event, and that's the audio recording from the 60s of, of that event. And so you can look at that as video materials, you can move between the two, you can hear the, that, but you can also turn on Wendy's narration, talking about this event and what she was doing and her reflexivity. So it's one route through the database of her material where I'm trying to put the context inside the storytelling so that that sense of time, place and occasion that happened when she filmed these events still is there um, for, for longer term use. So that's just some thinking about different ways that you can think about live performance and performative acts uh, in interactive documentary and ways that they can begin to be used for a call to action. And one other piece I'll just mention was about uh, Indonesia and about British interests in Indonesian coal mining. And it was an interactive documentary, 
but as part of a call to action, they invited everybody who'd experienced the documentary to send a lump of coal to the minister, the British minister, who was responsible for the policy that was exploiting Indian coal man miners for our gain. And he got, it was an aid agency, and this, this minister got absolutely inundated with lumps of coal, which kind of really annoyed him. But that's another example of live performance, if you like, doing a performative act uh, as a form of activism. So that's it. Thank you very much, Judith. It was very interesting. Uh, we have time for two questions. It's now the icebreaker. There's anyone who has a question for Judith in the audience today? Just raise your hand. I can see you now. You can see one? You. Have you seen one? No, yeah, sure. Emiliano, which is one of our <laughs> typical <laughs> QA <laughs> participants. Emiliano from La Salle, which is a coordinator of a master's degree and very interested in gamification and transmedia production. Gracias por la presentación, super interesante. Eh, eh, una cosa que no sé, porque bueno, realmente es una disciplina relativamente nueva, eh, de cuenta interactivo. ¿Cuál sería la tendencia, según tu punto de vista y tu experiencia, a nivel de interactividad, la que yo produzco como autor o la que la gente produce como colectivo? Es decir, ¿la tendencia sería más el autor interactivo o el colectivo interactivo? So, he's wondering which is the trend in interactive documentary regarding interaction. If this uh, interaction is more like the author, just so showing, a, a, for example, a work, or it's more collective, it's more a collaborative or a group like Mandy did. What do you think about the future or foreseeing possible trends? Um, I mean, there's a lot of talk nowadays that the audience want to become the audience want to become part of the story now. So a lot of the work I've been doing with immersive theatre is all about putting the audience inside the story and also making the audience the subjects so that they are actually telling the story and creating the story as well. So that's definitely out there uh, as a concept and there's people saying that is the future of storytelling. But as I say, the best way to predict the future is to invent it and we don't know. And for me, I think it depends on what your purpose is. If you want to involve the, the audience and if you want to be a facilitator, allowing and helping other people to tell their stories, that's fine. But if you're like Adam Curtis and you absolutely have something that you need to tell the world, I think you can do that with interactive media as well. So um, only time will tell. But, but I certainly think that the internet, you know, that cinema and that, that, that passive consumption of film, you know, it's still there and it's still really important, but the internet is the new medium, the new mass medium that, that is affecting the way we're consuming our stories and that does allow more of that interactivity. But whether at the end of the day people will want it, whether it will stick, who knows? Time for another question. Anyone? Uh, I would like to ask you briefly about the connection between interactive documentary and anthropology. Mm -hmm. How do you think that interactive documentary can contribute or can, en can enrich anthropology theory or the field? Mm -hmm. How you can mm -hmm. mix or intersect this section? How, how you see as an expert in anthropology as well? Well, um, one of the things that I'm really interested in to do with anthropology is the idea of, is Levi Strauss had the idea of deep structures and surface structures. So he saw culture as a surface structure. So that's difference, you know, cultural differences as something being on the surface, but that there were deeper structures that are more, that bring us together. And these are the similarities as well as the differences between us. And I think that idea of deep and surface structure, anthropologists used to talk a lot about cross-cultural communication, whereas now quite a few people talk about inter cultural, between cultures, and even trans-cultural. So ideas that can transcend cultural differences and, and look for ways that we can connect and find similarities across difference. And I think that's really important, understanding difference and being able to negotiate in today's political situation, where I personally think 
things are a bit of a mess, that we need to bring those skills of communication and transcultural communication are really important. And I think that interactive documentary is a really important tool through which we can use some of that anthropological knowledge to actually create debate in society. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Let's give a big hand to Judith. And